from Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, we live, um, live, in, a, we live in a broken world, if, it, if it's not obvious to you. Um, for one example, um, consider this excerpt from Ulata Equiano's 1789 autobiography of his time spent in slavery in the Americas in England. Um, this is a description that he shares of being re- reunited briefly with his sister. I shared this a couple years ago uh, when we spent some time exploring sort of a biblical view of, of race and ethnicity and racism, but um, I, wanted, I wanted to share this again. Here's what he says. In this manner, I had been traveling for a considerable time. When one evening, to my great surprise, whom should I see brought to the house where I was but my dear sister? As soon as she saw me, she gave a loud shriek and ran into my arms. I was quite overpowered. Neither of us could speak, but for a considerable time clung to each other in mutual embraces, unable to do anything but weep. Our meeting affected all who saw us, and indeed I must acknowledge in honor of those able destroyers of human rights. I, nev- I was never met with any ill treatment or saw any offended- offered to their slaves except tying them when necessary to keep them from running away. When these people knew we were brother and sister, they indulged us together, and the man to whom I suppose we belonged lay with us, he in the middle, while she and I held one another by the hands across his breast all night. And thus for a while we forgot our misfortunes in the joy of being together. But even this small comfort was soon to have an end, for scarcely had the fatal morning appeared when she was again torn from me forever. I was now more miserable, if possible, than before. The small relief which her presence gave me from pain was gone, and the wretchedness of my situation was redoubled by my anxiety after her fate and my apprehensions lest her suffering should be greater than mine when I could not be with her to alleviate them. So that's one small slice of one man's life and one woman's life, and it contains multitudes, doesn't it? Now, I don't know that he would say that was the most horrific moment of his time enslaved or not, but, um, but it's a horrific moment. My question to you in hearing just this piece of this story is this. How does it make you feel? In hearing this, what do you want? In hearing this, what must be done? Well, chattel slavery has inflicted and continues to inflict untold misery on God's image bearers across the world. But even it, as horrific as it is, represents only a fraction of the sort of deep sufferings and injustices that take place in the world every day. In fact, everyone, everyone has been made the victim of evil at some point or another, either in relatively small ways or relatively huge ways. Every corner of the world has its own forms of evil it's allowed to fester and to flourish. The cries of the victim shout at some point or another from every place as far as Israel, Palestine, And back again, even from homes right around here in this neighborhood, the homes that constitute inner northeast Portland. No place is untouched. So I'm taking even just a second to to remind ourselves of this. I ask you again, what do you want? My suspicion is that you want justice. You want goodness, wisdom, truth, beauty, proportionality to prevail and for an end of injustice and suffering to come in each place where it's found. You want the abuses to be stopped and thus you want the victimizers to be stopped and if you believe in God, which the vast majority of us here today do, I assume, you want him to feel the same way. We need him to feel the same way. 
To use a word that's found in the passage Hannah read for us, we need him to condemn evil desperately. The Greek term for condemnation that Paul uses in Romans 8.1, Romans 8.1, is uh, katakrima. It means not just a pronouncement of guilt, i.e., this is wrong, this thing is wrong, and I condemn it, though it includes that. It's not just that, though. It's also a sentence, a consequence, a penalty. It's both a moral judgment declaration and a decisive action to limit or to end what has been done. I try to make this point from time to time. But I truly believe we should all on some level, and we all do yearn for God to be a God who condemns sin, evil, and injustice. Because the alternatives are just too horrifying. Either there is no transcendent God, in which case there's no objective basis for determining the just from the unjust, good from the evil, or there is a God who simply doesn't care about injustice or evil. He doesn't care about goodness. He doesn't care about human flourishing. He's indifferent to it all. So if we're going to be able to make moral sense of this world around us that's just begging for it, indeed, if we're going to exist in a moral universe at all, we need a God who condemns evil when he sees it. And where this, where this gets uncomfortable is when we realize that God's standard doesn't play favorites when we realize it isn't just events like the Holocaust that God is exclusively concerned with, though thank God that he is concerned about it, but also the small heart-level acts of dehumanization that lead to it. The Holocaust, the small acts that lead to it, and everything in between he is concerned about. This isn't just, it's not just sexual violence that God condemns, though thank God that he does but the interior objectifications and lustful dehumanizations that we entertain within our minds and everything in between. It isn't just murder and bloodshed that God condemns, but, well, let's listen to the words of Jesus, Matthew 5, 21. You've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. I'm convinced that on some level our discomfort, and I know all of us probably have discomfort with the condemnation of the biblical God. It isn't because, though because we're more compassionate than him, but because we're less compassionate than him. We want him to care after things have accrued enough collateral damage, but he wants to stamp it out at the root, at the seed, at the soil even. So the problem, if we're honest, infects us all. The moral standard that God sets, the one that if followed, would produce a world of complete justice, of complete flourishing and beauty and goodness and life, is one that we all fall short of. At least if you're anything like me. And if we're honest, I think we could all admit that we fall short of even our own moral standards. Not to, to say nothing of God's, but just the ones that you've created for yourself, we still fall short, at least if you're anything like me. We're guilty of this, which the Bible calls sin. And the condemnation for this sin is death, the final limiting of our ability to sin against those around us. All that I've just said is one way of framing how the Bible describes the human predicament. It's not everything, but it is a piece of it. The world and the people that God made were created gloriously, beautifully, intentionally, delightfully good. Our first parents rebelled against God and introduced sin and evil and injustice, which brought the necessity of death. And we all find ourselves per participating in and perpetuating this story of sin and rebellion. And death continues to loom. So the question is, what can be done? Well, for the rest of the season of Lent, uh, through Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the next six weeks, we're going to be considering the gospel or the good news of Jesus, uh, the aspects of it at least that are found in Romans chapter 8 specifically, uh, which is widely regarded as one of the most beautiful and hope-filled chapters in the Bible, and I agree. But its beauty and hope does not come at the expense of realism. 
It's an honest exploration of some of the hardest realities of human nature alongside the good news of Jesus and how he and his Holy Spirit answer those realities. So in these verses, we will consider the grace of God over condemnation, the spirit of God over our sin-stained flesh, our new family over slavery, our coming glory over our suffering, divine help over our weakness, and security in the love of God over anything that would dare oppose it. So the series contains, um, the this, <laughs> this scripture rather, contains some of the most glorious truths of the gospel in the Bible. And so we've titled the series, The Cross, the Spirit, and the End of Death. And that's, what, that's the plan from now to through Easter. So we're going to look at the first four verses of the chapter, um, but first I think we should pray. Father, these, um, these are beautiful words, but they're intense words, Lord. These are, these are words that have been mishandled, um, wielded like weapons in some cases, misunderstood, understood, but, but underappreciated, Lord, and probably lots of other things, too. God, we ask that you would grace us with just um, your empowering presence, Lord. Open our ears, open our eyes to receive what you have for us, Lord. May this good news hit our ears and our hearts as, as so good, incomprehensibly good, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for the truths of your word, especially of this chapter. We pray that we would we'd come to them rightly and that you would change us through them by the power of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, um, we start today. We're, we're going to we we'll get to hear from other, a couple other folks as well. Next week, we'll actually get to hear from Michelle Jones over at Imago Day. She's going to come back and join us. Everybody, was here, anybody here last year when Michelle came? Yeah. Um, so, that'll be fun. But for now, stuck with me. Verse 1, Romans chapter 8. Verses 1 and 2, we'll, we'll start there. There's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And as always, that therefore there in verse one just reminds us that chapter eight comes after other chapters, doesn't it? After the first seven chapters, but specifically uh, what happened immediately before in chapter seven. So Paul had been describing the purpose of the law of God found in the first five books of the Bible to demonstrate both God's will and humanity's own inability to fully submit to it. The question then, at the end of chapter 7, is like, what can be done? It's our same question. Like, what, if this is the predicament, God has revealed the good, we can't live up to it. In fact, we're only finding condemnation again and again and again as we try to live up to it. What is there to be done? And chapter 8 is an answer to that in numerous ways. And the center of that answer lies in the cross of Jesus and the sending of the Spirit, themes that come up again and again and again in Romans chapter 8. So now is a reminder. There is therefore now no condemnation. That now is a reminder that there was condemnation for us apart from Jesus. And, and hopefully the first few minutes we spent here are a reminder that, that like, there is a necessary condemnation for sin. And I know it makes every one of us uncomfortable, myself included, but the alternative, again, is too horrific to entertain. God does care about our sin. I think it can be argued if God is going to be good, he must condemn our sin. But the now doesn't just, <laughs> thankfully, highlight that. It says now something is different. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, for God has fulfilled every requirement in his strange, supernatural, mysterious economy. However it works, he's required everything necessary to free us from that condemnation. The one that if we're honest, we've earned. The one that if we're honest, we deserve. He has done it all to free us from it. So we'll get into the, the, the how as, as the verse is going by. I want to stop there to say this, like, do you condemn yourself? Do you struggle with guilt? Do you struggle with shame? 
Do you, do you struggle with the little voices that come and go sometimes that say you, God couldn't really love you? In fact, nobody could really love you. That thing, if anyone knew that you did that or that you do that or that you're planning to do that, no one would really love you. You're unlovable, undeserving. You sometimes feel as if an outside voice is speaking condemnation over you. I do. What Paul declares is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And that no condemnation, it's not just that, you know, the condemnation has come and he's kind of done away with it, it might come in. It's no condemnation means the category has been erased. It's not a thing for you anymore when you are found in Jesus Christ. The bail has been paid. The penalty has been waived. He goes on to say, he goes on to say that you've been set free. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We've been transferred from the rule of law that produced sin and death in us to the rule of the Holy Spirit who produces life in his grace. Jesus has set us free from all that could only produce death in us. And I know, we're, okay, we're, you know, Romans has a reputation for just being kind of like this kind of sticky and tricky theology, and we're reading this, and we're like, okay, okay, lots of theological truth there, that's nice and good, but what in the world is happening in this? Well, Paul's going to give us a little bit more track to run on in the next verse. How does this work? Let's see if we can untangle it in verses 3 and 4. First, verse 3. So for God, he's done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. What he's saying is that the law could not help but bring further condemnation upon us. It earned us condemnation, not because the law was evil. Part of his point here, the law was not evil in and of itself. God did not give an evil law, but because we were evil. Because we could not live up to it. It could only bring condemnation. It could only produce failure as we try and try and try and try to live to meet the requirements of what he's called us to. To try to live into his vision for what it means to be a good and beautiful and healthy and flourishing and loving human being. We keep falling on our faces, at least if you're anything like me, you do. But it was not because the law was evil. It was because the law was weakened by the flesh, by our flesh. So God had to do something. So what did he do? Did he just explain the law more clearly so that we could really do it? Hey, man, if you just, like, understand this a little bit more accurately, then you'll you'll have what you need. Did he give us some kind of self-help techniques or life hacks? Did he give us a pep talk? Kind of like football coach mode. You can do this. You can do this coaching my son's uh, first grade basketball team right now, and it's nuts out there, friends. <laughs> it's nuts out there. It has no bearing on the sermon. I just said get up, get off my chest. It's a delight, and it is, it is wild. It's a wild time. Um, <laughs> no, Jesus isn't in, isn't in coach mode. He's not a self-help guru. What it says is in an act of free grace, Just a gift, just a gift, a gift. And all that that implies, he sent his own son, his own son, at great cost to himself. And the son came in the likeness of sinful flesh. I think it was John Stott that commented on this. He said, not in the likeness of flesh, because he had real flesh. Hope you believe that. Jesus had genuine flesh and blood, body just like you and I. So it wasn't the likeness of flesh, but he didn't also come in sin because he was sinless, of course. He's the perfect son of God. It was the likeness of sinful flesh, the appearance of flesh that was sinful. Genuine flesh, not sinful. And he came for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. In Jesus, God found a way to condemn sin in the flesh of Jesus so that we might not have to be condemned. He took our sin and received the condemnation on the cross. 
As Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.24, I think working in the same idea, but just with a little bit more precise language, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So the perfectly righteous one took the condemnation for our unrighteousness that we could be declared righteous in him. He didn't paper over sin. He didn't just say, I am now deciding I don't care about sin. Sometimes that's how we read this. We go, okay, so God just suddenly doesn't care about sin anymore, which again, you chase that logic down, suddenly the world becomes a moral nightmare once over. But that's not what he did. That's not what he did. He didn't paper it over, but the cost was covered. We didn't deserve it, and yet he did it freely. This is grace, friends. So verse 3 deals with how we are set free from condemnation and thus are able to be declared righteous before God. Jesus came in the flesh and took it onto himself. Sin was condemned in the flesh. This is what theologians often call the doctrine of justification. We are free from condemnation, thus able to be declared righteous before God. This is justification. But the question remains, okay, that is beautiful. That's true. Praise God for that. I hope that excites you. I hope that gives you just boundless joy. But the question remains, what about the sin then that remains in our day-to-day lives? What about the sin that is tormenting and haunting maybe you from someone else outside of yourself or maybe from within yourself? The sin that's, you know, creating national disasters and the deepest traumas and pains of people's lives. What about that? Does God care about that too? What about spiritual formation? What about our conformity to Christ? What about being putting to death the reality of sin in our lives, or as theologians call it, what about our sanctification? And that's where verse 4 comes in. So he's done this for a purpose, for another purpose. Verse 4, in order that, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the answer to the other side of the condemnation equation is here. Not just pronounced righteousness, though we need that. Thank God for that. Thank God for that but genuinely to be made increasingly righteous. Paul says that Jesus ended our condemnation in order that the heart of God expressed in the law could actually be fulfilled in us. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And what is the heart of God expressed in the law? Well, Jesus told us pretty clearly when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. To become people of love, self-giving, sacrificial love, like our God. Love expressed towards him and towards neighbor. Okay? People of love. Great. Let's get another pep talk. (laughs) Let's get Cameron out there on the basketball court, clapping at the kids. Let's get more insight so that we can do it. No. No. That's not what this says, at least. It says, by the giving of his Holy Spirit. It's his gracious enablement by giving us the power of his presence within us. This says is that This side of the cross, this side of trusting Jesus, our job is still not to bootstrap it up towards obeying the law by the power of our flesh, but to yield ourselves more and more and more daily and daily and daily to the influence of God within us. To walk according to the Spirit. That last sentence declares. To walk according to the Spirit. Much more on this next week from Michelle. I have to put a pin in that for now. No spoilers for next week, people. But for now, I want us to see in this passage that part of the good news, the good news of Jesus is that he sets us free from condemnation. He sets us free from having to perform under the law. Sets us free from the power of sin and death in our lives. And this is good news for us, friends. 
But here in verse 3, we see that this is how the good news of grace for you becomes good news also for your neighbors in a certain way, in a certain sense. Because His Spirit actually empowers you to become more and more a person of love the longer you walk in step with Him. Isn't that what the fruit of the Spirit is about? It's just a cute thing that Paul came up with. This is what it looks, this is what the Spirit is meant to produce in our lives. The closer we walk with Him, the more we give ourselves over to Him. Love and joy, peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. All these beautiful things, these Christ-like things welling up within us because He is at work within us. That when your neighbor, who maybe you've been mistreating, maybe you've been hurting, Maybe you've been callous towards. Maybe you've been cold towards. When they see you, if you yield yourself to him, your presence actually becomes like good news for them. What God is doing in you actually has real import in the people that you live your life around. The good news for you before God also becomes good news in this world. If we're doing our jobs right as Christians, giving ourselves over to him, he actually changes us that we might become a blessing to those around us. That is the logic of the gospel. It's not merely you and God and just personal, okay, now I've, just, I've got what I need for eternal security. Praise God for that. But it is meant to flow out of your hands and your feet and your tongue to care and bless and serve and help flourish the people around you. It's good news in both directions. Praise God for that. The people of God are meant to become the hands and feet of Jesus as we encounter the sins, the sufferings, the ills, the evils of the world that we considered. Sin is dealt with in both directions. So a final question remains. Like, all this is beautiful and true, and a lot of what's going to happen in chapter 8 is going to take the implications of this and blow them out. And so we're not going to belabor this right now. But we just, the, the final question is this. That sounds pretty nice. I hope, I hope you think that sounds pretty nice. Pretty good. How do we get it? How do we get these blessings? How do we become one of those who are in Christ? All of this comes for those who are in Christ, union with Christ. I hope it's pretty clear from what Paul has said that it's not by trying really hard. It's not by cleaning up your act. It's not by self-help or anything else like that. You can't do it. Law can't do it. The whole point is that Jesus did. We were stuck, but God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. How? Sending his son. Sending his son. He did everything necessary. And we receive that what he did through trust, through belief, through faith. Pick your poison on that word there, on that verb. We trust, we believe, we have faith, pledge allegiance to. As Romans 10, 9 says a little bit later on, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be saved. Shorthand for all of this and more. And much more. Trust Jesus. You don't earn it. You receive open-handedly what he has earned for you. And step into this new reality and receive his spirit. This is good news, friends. Not to try harder, but to receive a free, loving gift from a God who on your worst day is crazy about you, who loves you, who has done everything necessary, including the sending of his own son to clear every bit of debris to bring you home. He does not hate you. He's not sick of you. He's not tired of you. He's not bored with you. He's not anxious about you. He loves you. He wants you. And he says, here's everything you need. At zero cost, just receive it. Just receive it and you will be saved. Well, I want to conclude maybe in a slightly unusual way. Um, 
I, I heard Tim Keller preach on this passage once, and, uh, and he, he tied it to this passage in John chapter 8, uh, verses 2 through 11, the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. And I'm not going to say anything about this. I want to kind of let these, this mis- semi-mysterious story of what Jesus has done, a story that Jesus enacted, that he lived, that's related to this, kind of rest on us for a moment. I'm going I'm to read this, read this for us, and I just, we'll, we're going to take a minute, and we're just going to think. In light of what Paul's saying here on the story from the life of Jesus. Jesus putting this, I think, these very ideas into practice in a very, very tangible way. And we're just going to chew on that and marinate that, in that for a minute. And then I'll close us out in prayer. But listen to what Jesus does. John 8, 2. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. And all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. Let's reflect.